All right. Big episode. We've been waiting for this one for a while. Uh, welcome to FinTech Corner. Um, my name is Joseph Trambarian. I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Travada. I'm joined by Brett Turner, our founder and CEO, fearless leader, <laughs> once again, uh, hitting the trails to talk about how uh, the world of FinTech is uh, not only continuing to be innovated in, but uh, might be transformed uh, in a pretty fundamental way by some of the technologies that we're seeing. And some of the it's things been a cool couple of months. Yeah, it's, it's been <laughs> fascinating. So why are we so excited? Um, Chat GPT. <laughs> the obligatory Chat GPT podcast, uh, which has been a, a long time coming. We actually have been looking at Chat GPT for a while. Um, so as soon as it came out, I mean, all of us were like, whoa, <laughs> is this real? Is this something that not only could we use at Travada, but is it going to be used generally, you know, in finance? And we took a deep dive into looking at what does it know, first of all, because all of the examples on the internet were just so incredible, very niche examples, writing contracts, taking the LSAT, yeah, taking the GMAT and getting pretty much a, a passing score, uh, being able to write entire essays on, on a topic. And your mind is just blown by that, right? When you think of the creative possibilities, the outlets that you have with this kind of technology. And so our question right away was, can it do math? <laughs> Could you use it for finance things? Well, I think there's the other aspect too of just uh, when something, it's so profound in the way it just, right. just captured everybody's imagination so quickly. And then, and, and I've, you know, got a lot of gray hair, been around for a while. So when something pops up initially, is it going to be, okay, is this going to be just a great way to maybe better curate cat videos? Or is this actually going to do really right. profound things like be the next, like, like the internet was when it, it came, came about. And I think that the, you know, the fresh wave of what happened with crypto last year over the last few years and how hyped it was with, you know, all the coins and the NFTs and, I think we went through kind of a wave of pessimism after that. But this is different. The difference is this has directly applicable use cases that today could actually transform our lives. And so when we started to look at this problem, and this has been a few months now in the making, so this is not you know fresh, hot off the press. We've been developing this hypothesis for a while. What we were frustrated with was the seemingly immense lack of context that it has. And in terms of finance, what is the one thing, the one sin that you cannot commit in finance? <laughs> Inaccuracy, right? You cannot make a math mathematical error of any kind. And there is no leeway for, well, that was close, you know? You were only off by, you know, a percentage or whatever it might be. Well, close, gets you, close gets you fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that percentage could be hundreds of millions of dollars. So that just doesn't cut it. And that was the first thing that we ended up seeing was breathtaking at the recommendations that it could offer, especially we looked at treasury, right? We looked at finance. We looked at FPNA as possible use cases where you could ask it open-ended questions about topics like how would I hedge a particular cash balance? Um, what would the methodology be? Um, how should I perform a, a forecasting exercise uh, to understand my risk over the next quarter uh, for a particular account? Complex question. I mean, these are not easy questions. And it would ask, you know, answer them with incredible accuracy from a strategy perspective. But then when you give it the opportunity to give you the calculation, like the net result, it would be so wildly off. <laughs> and you'd just scratch your head and be like, are you hallucinating? Well, and like, I remember, you know? right, like early in the labs, it was, right. I remember you showing me, it literally was a table. Yeah. And there were numbers on the table. I mean, it was, I don't know, a few columns right. and seven or eight rows. You, you, you could scan the numbers down and, and just eyeball it and say, yeah, that's not quite right. The, right. Just exactly. having it sum up essentially the rows, which, which seemed really great. Well, right then and there, you're just... Instantly as a finance yeah. person, your credibility, drop. once you lose credibility or integrity of, of just doing the basic computational math, right. like you're done, like you're out. And that's, that's the way it is. That's, that's the harsh reality when you're dealing you know, yeah. with finance. And, you know, we didn't want to be discouraged because at the end of the day, 
it was providing value because it's a, it's the equivalent of having another person, if you will, that knows how to do something. It's just that that person failed every math course that they ever took in their entire life, but they just turned out to be brilliant in every other regard. And so we went back to the drawing board to try to understand how could we use this technology and marry it with the capabilities we already have, right? Because well, and one thing too, it it, it the is the big thing is context. What is it right. using to derive all that? And this is all stuff that it's being fed, exactly. or it's on the internet, or things. And so, you know, you think of th- this aspect of it doesn't really know anything about Travada. It doesn't right. know have any of the things that are. And this is essentially this is this is what Travada does. It's automating right. cash workflows, but it's not using any of those tools or have any of that exactly that data at its disposal right it maybe knows about us by our website <laughs> it knows that Travada is a cash plat you know cash management platform but it doesn't know anything about the customers of Travada because we're very serious about privacy and making sure that that data is never you know available so then the question is what value could it bring if it doesn't have access to your transactions and balances so we went back to the drawing board and we started to think about what if technology like this large language model technology, we could leverage the inherent benefits of its ability to navigate natural language, right? Because that's the breakthrough. It's the fact that you can converse with it and it'll remember what you're saying. And so just from a user experience kind of standpoint, that's breakthrough because it allows for operators and folks that might be looking at a tool like Travada or any other tool and maybe they have the cognitive load or dissonance of, man, I, I just want to do this one thing and I don't want to have to poke around and figure out how to do it and maybe get it wrong. And instead, they could just tell the thing, this is what I want. Can you give me what I want? And the breakthrough is that it, it knows what you're talking about, right? And so how did we do that? I think that's, well, and, that's and, the, 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 the question. And a big piece there was such a, I mean, a couple of things. One is, again, the whole aspect of, you know, the vision of Travada is we're, right. we're helping, you know, automate. It's not just, you know, initially people are like, oh, you're the, the, the mint of for corporates. And it's like, yeah. well, no, it's not just pretty charts. It's not just even better, more consumerized interfaces. It's, it's actually more of literally doing work for you, automating a lot of the workflows that you right. have, saving you lots of time, you know, putting your this power at your fingertips. And then the aspect of just even using natural language search and how to do that, whether it's the categorization of all your bank data, uh, being able to kind of inter, you know, weave in uh, other kinds of external bank data. So it, it, the, the things that we're already doing and leveraging, it just seemed to be such a natural fit because then it was just, right. It was like taking that to a whole different level in terms of like a whole, you know, conveyor belt or a speed path. that's just going to accelerate so that even how we leverage search yeah. so much, I mean, natural language within already the interface, except you're typing it in like you would search for something right. on the on the internet, you know, just for, for those little contacts with Travada. So like, it just seemed like such a natural fit in terms of getting our hands on it too and, and, and playing with it, right? You bring up a good point. And that's, it actually is, if we wanted to summarize, you know, how did we think about the approach because it's more than just, you know, can chat GPT answer questions? It's Travada provides functionality that extends beyond just question answering, right? It's analytics, it's forecasting, it's capabilities that it might not be able to do without that context and without maybe even the capabilities at its disposal. So we just framed it a little differently. We asked, what if instead of the end user having to be an expert in how to use Travada, all of our tools, reporting, forecasting, tagging, all the capabilities that we've talked about, searching, what if ChatGPT could do that? What if it became the expert in our platform? And because it's so great at understanding user questions, it would simply take those questions and filter it through its own knowledge of our platform and say, I know how to find that. Let me go use Travada to calculate the exact answer that you're looking for and serve it back to you using Travada and all of its native capabilities. And then it becomes this hybrid, right, where you don't have to worry about whether or not 
the large language model is able to calculate something accurately because it's not even going to try. It instead is going to use a tool that is at its disposal and it's going to use that to calculate, but then it's going to use its own capabilities of context to be able to converse with you and say, well, you just asked me for, you know, your free cash flow or your free or average free cash flow over the last 30 days. And I presented it to you in a table. And now you've asked me, actually, could you put it into a graph so that I can see kind of the trend? And it says, no problem. I remember what I gave to you just a few moments ago. Let me put that into a graph, right? And yeah. that kind of interaction is really breakthrough because it feels very similar to the behavior you might have if you were on, for example, Slack or something like that and chatting with someone, a colleague, and trying to figure something out together. And you know that that colleague knows how to use software, knows where to look, uh, has gone through <laughs> schooling <laughs> on finance topics so that you're not having to explain basics. It's as if you have an extra hand. Yeah. Well, and I think that the couple things there, one of that, that translation layer is just so important because Travada in the hands of an expert or a finance person, right. a treasury person, they just know what to ask. They know how to compile things. They, it helps them be a lot more autonomous in how they, they do that work. It's, you know, that whole aspect of, you know, the robotics of, of just generating or compiling or doing, so you're, you're doing that a lot faster with a lot of help but you still kind of have to ask the questions. It, it comes from somebody who has the knowledge to be able to ask the right questions in the right way or be discerning enough or have judgment enough right. based on that background and knowledge to say, when the result comes up, say, well, that's not quite right. I know that right away because of this, this, and this. Right. Whereas somebody who doesn't have that, they ask it, they get the results and they say, oh, great. And then play that back right away without you know that filter. So I think you know now when you basically take though that that translation layer and start to automate that then you really are bridging the gap so somebody who is a you know a business owner who may not have a lot of finance knowledge or but they're super smart about their business and they know the aspects about their business there might be nuanced financial questions they might not frame it up they don't right. understand you know gap accounting or revenue recognition rules or certain things but they don't need to because now you have that translation layer and that's sort of that last mile that's so powerful now solved for you, bridging that gap intelligently for you. Right. And now it starts to make sort of the dream come true a little bit, bridging that gap of, of you know, closer to full automation. I mean, we're, it's still early days, but the promise that we're seeing when at the end of the day, not, you know, not just using the academics in some ways of, and that powerful knowledge of ChatGPT and all of its, com you know, computational Right. aspects about it but it's it's literally it's it's within the Torada environment so it's using the the tools the the ways to do math it's right. it's not relying on its own knowledge of how to do math that maybe it learned somewhere who knows where exactly but now it's using the right things that Travada has at its disposal to be able to do those things it's just a marriage that's that's beautiful and so powerful to see and that's the other thing is that the underlying assumptions of where you got the data how was the data cleansed? Um, is this data reliable in the first place? Those are handled by Travada, right? Because if, let's say, you were to just put a bunch of data into ChatGPT, which you can do. You can take a CSV file right now with a bunch of transactions, as an example, feed it, get, and it'll process it for you, right? And try to give you an answer. The problem is ChatGPT knows nothing about that data source other than you gave it to it and that because you gave it to it, it's likely what you want, right? It doesn't know whether or not it's accurate. It doesn't know which accounts it's applicable to. It doesn't know the context of how much data you have overall. If there are, for example, missing transactions in that data set, it would never know that. It's not performing reconciliation for you, right, to know if there are any issues gap analysis, any of those things. So it is kind of a, in the world of finance, a garbage in, garbage out type of scenario, which is why we really had to solve this problem first, right? If you can't trust the data, if you can't trust the context, if you can't trust the math, how could you ever trust this tool, right? And I think that's where we have seen across all of the conversations that have happened in generative AI, where 
as you said, you know, is this just another tool for generating really cool memes and pictures yeah. and, and stuff like that? It's obviously more than that. But the limitations are very clear as well where it starts to f- drop off dramatically. And it's always context. It's always yep. what can you expect it to know given the fact that you haven't told it anything, right? And, and it's, you know, if you think of, uh, okay, is this going to fully automate a finance department or accounting department or a treasury department? It's, it's, it's more of if you think of what's been going on forever or, you know, for it seems forever now <laughs> yeah. of just lean teams, yeah. It's this, if you look at the last 10 to 15 years, finance, treasury accounting, everything is more and more compliance heavy and, and, um, and everything continues down this trend like we've seen in IT with cloud of just uh, trying to get to cost compression, trying to get to more uh, leverage and scale. And, and it hasn't really made its way into finance and accounting or, or, or treasury just because there haven't been the tools to be able to get there. Right. So when you look at these massive shifts like with IT and AWS and how you could, you're saving 70% on your IT costs and things that have happened over the years, you just don't get that same compression. Right. And, and what happens is, but you, you, you think you should. So there's been a little bit. And so then uh, as you need to do more and the compliance rigor continues to add in the world that we have now. Right. So when you think of this constantly having to do more with less, it's incredibly difficult, challenging and annoying for every finance, treasury accountant because they're, they're having to, to figure that out. There's, they're kind of left to their own devices to figure out whether their own ways to get a little bit of leverage to do a little bit more and, and then it becomes this vulnerability aspect of like, if there's one little thing that kind of interjects into this really tight schedule or right. process that they've got dialed in and it throws that off a little bit, um, you think of something like COVID and March of 2020, you think of everything dialed into this tight process and we have to do these things. There aren't enough hours. Monkey wrench comes yeah. in, like you're, 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 you're in trouble. You're yeah. toast. Yeah. So this everything has been compressed into the I've got to play defense so well to do all this thing from a protectionist standpoint, there's no room to really do any sort of, you know, uh, anything offensive or getting this data out. And so um, it now it's like you have what could be the smartest, the smartest person on your team or the a team of analysts on your team. So, you know, if we could just get that one additional person on the team or, if we could hire this one person and, and well, there's no budget for that. Now yeah. you've got something that extends your team and really solves that problem in a way that is, has been the recurring uh, uh, aspect or a nightmare for every, you know, finance team out there. And I, we can't really overlook and stress enough how important it is to be able to meet that end user in the moment. Because if you're stressed in that way, Let's say that rewind the tape all the way to COVID when it was happening, you know, and we were running around with our carts in Target wondering how many <laughs> uh, boxes of cereal we should buy and should we get the entire, you know, uh, toilet paper section, you know, because we don't know what to do. Well, the other folks that were reacting that same way, exactly as you're saying, were in finance, trying to figure out how long can we keep our doors open, Um can we make payroll if we have absolutely no sales volume over the course of the next few weeks? How many weeks do we have? Um, what happens if this extends to longer than a few weeks? What options do we have from a liquidity perspective? We have, you know, lines of credit. What, it, what is it? Now, imagine being in that situation. And every time you have one of those questions go through your head, the equivalent is hours of hard work in Excel to prepare data, to make sure that it's accurate, to format it, present it, then make a decision, then go back and make another one and another one and another one. Imagine if there were tools at that moment in time that could keep up with the pace of your frenetic ideas, right? Where you're trying to get answers quickly and you just want to tear down the barriers you might not need perfection in terms of formatting or the exact colors or whatever you might need on the visualizations, but you need answers and you need to trust them. And you need to build on those Lego blocks of answers because if you are able to get to a conclusion, maybe that means that you do make payroll and you found a creative solution, right? 
Well, and, and you're talking scenario planning, and that's right. just one of the hardest things to, to do. And that's why people who are really good at building, uh, and there's a whole art to constructing models in Excel and being really, really good at it. Right. Everybody can build a model, but there's few people that know how to build them really, really well. Right. And if you, you're really trying to build tons of leverage in there so you can put certain inputs in, and then it's going to auto, automatically calculate or drive a lot of the, uh, from, a, from a set of assumptions what those results are going to be. Yeah. And those are going to be things that are going to uh, really drive value or impact or answer big questions, or they might be at the point of making a pivotal decision for your business. Right. Um, those are game changing things. But if you don't have it built well, or even really good models, you're putting in assumption. And then it's like, you've got to turn the crank, so to speak, like it's this big machine and you've got to figure out what we've got to spend hours and hours with lots of people to figure out, okay, what is that going to translate to in terms of action that we can take? Yeah. And, and that goes on. That's been going on for, you know, so long, decades, forever. Like, so if you think of if there's a truly a way, uh, a way to be able to uh, feed assumptions in, but that whole turning of the crank isn't done through these clunky models or risk with potential error, and it's done at two in the morning. And, and this is going to determine, like with COVID, a lot of finance people weren't able to or treasury folks weren't able to kind of go, uh, you know, and, and get groceries or, or, or the toilet paper, the cereal. Right. They were kind of locked in a room for 48 hours trying to figure out like, you know, is our revenue going to complete, if our revenue falls off and 30%, are we going to have to, are we going to be able to stay in business or are we going to have to make a really tough decision now to let go 20% of our workforce or 50% right. of our workforce? Yeah. I mean, these are affecting lives, huge, you know, monumental decisions and, we all kind of went through that, that phase, which was, which was terrible. Right. So yeah. you're, you're thinking all these ominous things. So you feel this pressure and then you don't have great tools to be able to get those answers quickly. And then you're, you're just pressing. I hope I, I didn't get, or you were rushing to build something and I hope there's not a formula error or I hope, what did I miss? And you're not getting enough eyes on. I mean, that, that's all the, the same stuff that's been happening forever. So if you can have something that really helps with that, process. I mean, that's, that's, that's just holy grail kind of stuff. And it, it, but yeah, it, but it does it require sort of a marriage of, of a lot of great, great things together. So what why, do we got? Why do we have a laptop here? <laughs> For those of you that have uh, watched the show a few times now in our studio, you'll, you'll notice that the laptop has replaced our plant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where's our plant, our friendly plant, but maybe yeah. really quick to set this up too. Like what, what, Let's talk about what really we did in the last couple of months. I mean, that yeah. was really the task. Like we, we don't want to do, we, it can't be something gimmicky. Cause that's the other thing is no. everything we do has is great intention with great. I mean, we're built Travada trove of data. We're building the, yeah. the most, the vision, the most powerful, you know, trove of financial data on the planet to automate workflow. So everything we do, and it has to be done at absolute, you know, integrity there has. So that's why we've actually started working on uh, from bank data and build right. APIs with the banks because that, that truth of record is so important in terms of the underpinnings of cash flow. Everything is sort of built off of. Um, so we don't let you put your own data in. If, you, if right. you have your own bank statement and put it in, like we don't just let you do that. It has to come through the API or directly from the bank to help keep we have that. to trust it. Right? Yeah, so if you think of now uh, how, what exactly have we done here in the task of making this, uh, truly valuable for Travada yeah. users or, you know, for companies. It's the marriage of some really, really cool things that have been lacking in finance or fintech. Yeah. Maybe uh, this was the big task, right, of, of in our labs, let's, let's make this all happen. I'm going to get a bunch, a bunch of the credit to Francisco, who had the vision uh, to see the possible uh, with with this technology, because I think that our reactions, a lot of the folks that saw this for the first time was exactly that. It's cute. It's interesting, but it's not ready for prime time. And it, it needed someone to see the possible and kind of forecast into the future. If we could solve these problems, then it would be a breakthrough, right? It would be something that everyone would want to use, especially in the world of finance. And I, I and think a shout out to Francisco, our yeah. VP of machine learning. So, yeah. uh, amazing it's, work it was i mean this this challenge to him in a lot of ways like and then he embraced it he's yeah. like all the stuff that he was working on it's like okay set that aside <laughs> right race yeah, this absolutely because and he it, went to work it's the type of thing where you know 
Well, the first time that you held an iPhone in your hand, if you can just recall those tingly feelings of like, this is different. This is going to change things. And we are starting to feel very similar feelings, right? Where it's a frontier that is evolving so fast and is so relevant uh, to our space and to every kind of aspect of technology that you almost feel this gravitation, this pull toward towards it. You have to figure out a way. And I think that that's why his willingness to kind of work through these problems. And I think of three pillars here that were really important uh, to, to the approach. Number one was the quality of the context. And we've been talking about that a bunch, but can't stress that enough. Without that, this is nothing, right? You don't have anything. Accuracy, the focus, the maniacal focus on will this be true and can you expect it to be true? And then the third pillar... Got to be is, able to bank on it. <laughs> right, exactly. The third one, though, that we haven't talked about at all yep. is privacy. Can I trust this thing? Will I have to share you know, every little piece of information about myself and our, our finances in order to get the value that you're talking about? And those three had to be in concert together to have a viable solution. Because this is not like working in you know, social media or in another arena where you might say, yeah, go ahead, take, uh, get access to all of my tweets. I don't care. You know, if, if it means that I'm able to generate better ones, that's, that's awesome. Or, you know, if I, if I want to use my social posts in some other platform, it's very different when you're talking about publicly traded companies, you're talking about highly sensitive information that cannot be shared under any circumstance with anyone even for the sake of automation, right? So we had to find a way to take the inherent benefits of the large language model approach of understanding language and being able to react to it and have context while also getting the bedrock security privacy that you get in Travada, which kind of, you know, it's kind of, it, when you think about it, h- how did you do that, right? Well, the way that we had to do that is by what we talked about a moment ago. We had to teach chat gpt how to use travada in a safe way in a way where the user is in control where we're not sharing any data with chat gpt in terms of your transactions your balances and but still at the same time giving you the ability to have that context so that it can in fact process that data and work to to get an outcome it's essentially what is essentially would you say it's just a private version of chat gpt we've sort of allowed ChatGPT to come into a very private, closed-loop yes. uh, setting. And then it's right. basically using all of the things that Travada at its disposal from data yes. and from tooling. So we're not, you know, we're not hosting ChatGPT. It's not running on our servers. It's still what it is. OpenAI owns all of that technology. It's theirs. What they don't have access to, though, is our API platform, our users' data, the context of how to use our platform and what to do within it so that you could actually get benefit out of it. And I think that's where the magic is happening. Let us calculate the math. Right. Don't let ChatGPT yeah. uh, calculate Yeah, let's work the... together, right? Yeah. If, there's a, if there's a fence, you can't cross that fence in terms of privacy, but we can send messages over it, right? Yeah. And if I say to you, hey, user just asked for um, what is an FBAR report of my last uh, uh, year's worth of data across all of my accounts. Can you produce that for me in a table? You can send that information to ChatGPT, and that doesn't say anything about the user's data, right? Well, and that that was one of the cool things. That ha- yeah. We don't ha- actually have that built into our... Pro- we sh- Honestly, we should, yeah. <laughs> but we, we don't yet. And it's more of a canned report, but it's basically just IRS guidelines to say, here's how you... Right. It's like filing 1099s, or it's finding... You need to file this, this report... Uh, here's when you need to do it, you know, April 15th. Um, and so it provides the guidance, gui- the IRS guidance. Yep. It basically knows that guidance because it, it has that indexed. And so it was able to basically just build that report on the fly, which is, which was incredible. And so. that's, what's so cool is that F bar, right? Unless you go and Google search it, which, you know, most people would have to, to even know what that acronym means. It is a hyper niche piece of information that is really only relevant to a very small part of the finance workforce, the treasurer, right? right? And it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's basically financial accounts, right? The reporting of that, uh, that you have to do because the IRS is, you know, uh, are, and the U S government is looking at 
you know, uh, international companies and some uh, companies that has got on the watch list. It's making to how are you doing business internationally? So it's right. usually just for larger companies generally. So most, you know, in treasury, everybody knows about it because treasury, treasury, uh, if the function exists usually for larger companies that are doing business internationally, not right. all, but generally um, some finance teams that are, that are big enough uh, if they, you know, that are big enough and doing business internationally, maybe that don't have a treasury team yet. Right. Uh, we'll do that. But it's, it is kind of a, a little bit more of a bigger scale. Uh, but if you're, you could be a smaller company and doing business internationally, having, you know, foreign accounts, you're, you're subject to that. And the, I guess the, the other kind of concept here being because it's niche in terms of the folks that would ever have to produce a report like that, the knowledge of it is where we see the breakthrough, right? Because Chad GPT knows what an FBAR report is. Why? Because it's read every possible website and PDF and book that has ever been written about treasury. So it knows. And IRS.gov. And, and, and <laughs> IRS.gov, right? So it knows that an FBAR is this. It looks like this in terms of structure. It'll have these columns as a requirement. And the data that you need in order to populate it is this. So we toss that over to ChatGPT. It looks it up. It says, oh, I know what an FBAR report is. And you're saying that you need it for the past year. Great. Well, now, how does it come back and get the data? So this is where the magic is happening. It's because we have formulated an approach that gives ChatGPT just enough context about how our database is structured so that it can then go and query it using our APIs. Granted the privilege to do so uh, using the user, right? But... It's not receiving the data. It simply is formulating a perfect request for how you might find that data in our database, giving it to us, and then we execute it. And because this experience is in our platform, that data never leaves. It gets presented inside of Travada. It gets visualized inside of Travada. And all that we ever really received from ChatGPT is the instruction set. It's, I know what an FBAR is. It's made up of this type of data. Here's the query that you would need to follow in order to arrive at this conclusion. So would you say this equivalent is almost like, uh, uh, so ChatGBT being this genius or a team of right. really smart financial analysts, they, they come to the, you know, to the, the military uh, uh, compound, if you will, right. and, and we've essentially given a, a badge or security clearance we're, you know, making sure that they clear through that, uh, the gate, uh, they're, they're not bringing anything with them or any of that. Yep. Uh, they're fully frisked. <laughs> they go through that. They, they come into the, into this, into the secure arena here. Right. And they're, they, they go into a room, they sit down and they've been given tools. They've been given access to the data. They can do all these things, but when they leave, they go out in the same way that they came in. Uh, I would, is that, that analogy? I would, bit? only modify it slightly by saying imagine that it walked into that room and it's been given access to people that are sitting with their hands on the buttons for the tools but it is not allowed to touch those buttons it can simply say to those people hey i need you to run this radar over here and then whatever you do give that to that person the control aspect right yeah that's uh, a just good point. do this you do that you do that and whatever I say, it will be the answer. And it gives it kind of like this, we're taking advantage of that genius, right? Yeah. It's ability to know the answer, but we're not actually letting it manipulate the data, touch the data, control the data, do anything with the data, really. And why why are we doing this? Why are we so serious and about that being, this, you know? Shravada being that, that buffer, that control layer. Right. Uh, of protection, essentially, to keep that guarded. The reason we're doing it is because our end users, our customers, trust us, right? They, in the first place, they signed agreements with us. We have said to them explicitly, your data will never leave Travada. It will never be accessible to anyone outside of your organization. Yep. Um, we'll make sure that we follow and pass every possible compliance rigor you could imagine uh, for, for this type of data. And we can't seed any of that. Right? right in the interaction here. And so what we think is such an important aspect to our approach is that you get to take advantage of that genius in chat GPT, but you get to keep everything else in terms of that privacy, security, 
all of the peace of mind that Travada is controlling all of those pieces. And the result is incredible, you know, and um, we, we have it here on the laptop and I, I'm sure that, you know, we have it on the screen right now for, for users to see, but the net result is ultimately an experience where in Travada, you have an interface where you can interact with ChatGPT, right? You're not going to ChatGPT, the website, the OpenAI, yep. but you're not going to Bing. You're not going to any of these websites to interact with it. It happens in Travada in a private session that is really only available to you as a customer. This interaction is not shared with other customers. It's not shared with any other user. Your data never leaves Travada. It's not available to ChatGPT as like log history, chat history, or anything like that. It's private. And as a result, as you can see here, you can start to ask really complex questions. Yeah. So um, maybe walk through a couple of the yeah the, the basic things that, 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 that we've done. We've done more complex things. And it, it's so cool to, to see where uh, just the iter of nature of it and how it's going to continue to build on itself. But maybe just a couple examples of... I, you know, on the screen right now, we have a couple of interesting prompts where one of the interesting things that you might want to know uh, if you're doing an analysis of your transactions over a period of time is which specifically out of those transactions might have been recurring and might have been large in terms of the overall amount uh, in your cash flow. And why would you need to know something like that? Well, uh, if you're trying to provide an analysis of where you could cut spend, right, you'd want to start with yep. where is most of the money going out. Right. And the second element of that is if it's repetitive, if it's happening in a way where it's predictable, then it's a... Like a subscription. Key, right, it's a key the, opportunity. Yeah. Um, so, well... Which is, is, is a growing issue. I mean, people right. have so many subscriptions to so many different tools to be able to say, hey... That's exactly right. Show, right. Me, show me the... Give me the, the top 10 tools and you're like, then you can quickly ask, are we even using this tool anymore? And you can quickly see what that expense exactly. might be. And, Imagine yeah. a CFO just being, you know, fed up. You know, I, every time I, I, I hear that there's a team kind of buying another tool, they haven't gone through procurement. You know, they, does anybody follow any yeah. process? I actually, want to report. Actually, you know? it happened with, with me. And yeah. it was probably a few months ago, right? We were just, for us, we use so many different tools. And right. that, I went on a little bit of rant. and I, and I then But it took a, a bit of work to compile all that. I mean, of this course. is something that's compiled in, now imagine in, uh, in seconds. This question, it had a couple of interesting keywords in it. It had, you know, largest, recurring. Uh, it's looking at a data set, transactions. Then you're also saying... All of my accounts, not just some, all. And you're giving it the specificity of, I, I want to know this within a range. So imagine all those pieces of context are being derived just from you typing a sentence. And then it takes that and formulates it into a table. I didn't have to ask it to do anything. It just said, oh, no problem. I can find those for you. And then it kind of gives you that output. Now, well, and, and this is one of the reasons why, again, just the, the vision behind even starting Travada and, and a little bit of my journey as a CFO of, of, of looking at getting closer to bank data and just true bottoms up cash flow, right. cash forecasting, a cash flow analysis is because it's, it is really hard to do analysis from data in your ERP system because you're dealing Absolutely. with something that's all predicated on accrual based accounting. It's all following gap and, and accrual based accounting is, so you, you have all of these, uh, um, a lot of these uh, accruals or estimates that you're making month end. And, and if you're closing the books really fast, like a two or three day close at right. month end, then you're making tons of estimates of what those expenses are. So when you try to do even your analysis from ERP data, you, you got to then sift through what's the estimates, what's real. I, can I just want to see my actual, you know, the, the cash outflows? It's really right. hard to, to pull that out. So when you're able to do it just strictly from the bank, because there's no estimates or accrual based no. accounting it's it's straight this is what was paid this is what is expended so as an fpna tool i mean this is it just allows it to take the, these kinds of analysis fpna wise to to the next level i mean we're already doing that but to now get sort of this on the fly recall is is incredible and imagine we didn't have to tell it hey when you look this up I want to have a little bit of context so that when I do my analysis, I have what I need in order to make a decision. It just figured that out. It gave us a column that gave us the transactions count so that we could say, oh, interesting. There have been 17 occurrences of this really big transaction that is happening from a specific account 
and it's in USD currency, and here's the average amount. It computed all of those things without me asking anything of it, right? Yeah. And this is the kind of thing where it's, it because it knows the standard operating procedure for a lot of these questions, it's taking from the inventory of all of the reports, all of the finance assumptions it's ever read about. And it's saying, given what you asked, I think this is what you're looking for. And this is why we get excited is because let's say that you were to text someone on your team on Slack yeah. and say, hey, do this analysis for me with that prompt, right? One sentence, not very much context. It's just, I need 30 days. I need it to be recurring and I need it to be across all accounts and it's, it has to be the biggest ones. Would they know that specifically, I need you to also show me how many times it occurred. Like mm-hmm. do the extra work, go the extra mile because I'm not going to just trust you that you're going to find yeah. the, the, the biggest ones. I want you to just show me your well, homework. Well, in, in, in the real world to this, when you start, let's say a, a CEO or a CFO is asking somebody on, on, uh, on his or her team, various things. Um, the first request, there's this dial, there's this interaction that needs to happen. It's part of the relationship. Right. You kind of need to know the context of what they really want because you might come to the table with what you think they want. Right. And then you might be a little off and they say, Oh no, 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 I need this and this. And pretty soon though, after a few months or it could take a little longer, it may take a, a, a couple of days, you're sort of recalibrated. Yep. You've learned kind of how to, what that person wants to be able to feed it up in, in the way that they want to see it. But that takes some time. Absolutely. So this is where the power of machine learning, also the things that we're doing, helping this along its way, get, right. you know, accelerate that journey to know really quickly what, what, who is asking the questions and also how to, how to put that data together in the right way as well. Right? Another little piece here that is worth kind of thinking about is in order to generate the transaction count, the average amounts, getting all these insights, well, you have to have the analytics capabilities to do that in the first place, right? If you didn't, how would it be able to arrive at that conclusion? These would be empty columns ultimately, right? right? So there's the marriage of it's super great at understanding context, but if it doesn't have the context and it can't calculate the context, then it's worthless. I mean, this is, it's a perfect marriage because this is what we're built. I mean, right. As a fintech, we've now, we have the largest library of APIs with banks. We have this, right. this massive and growing trove of financial data, of bank data. The, and, and users are curating their own financial position of, uh, um, across their accounts. Um, right. You know, whether if a foreign currency exposures, uh, they're categorizing all their data. They're letting us, through auto-tagging, categorize yep. some of their data. So the, the data management aspects of that, I mean, that's at a core how we've built this thing. And it, 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 that's got to be the fundamental, I mean, that's the fundamental building block of Travada because right. everything you can't automate if you can't have the, the data underneath it all, all locked and sort of allowing that to happen. Right. So it, it really is a, it, it's leveraging all the stuff that we've built. So let's, let's keep going on uh, your point, which was the CFO had, uh, you know, maybe it was a, a junior uh, uh, accountant or someone looking into some of this, this information. In your example, they have to go through a little bit of training, and I'm sure that every time that it happens is there's a grumble as they're walking out of the office saying, of course you want it in a different format. You know, you, you couldn't just take with my original. <laughs> well, what happens then, right? They have to go back to work. They have to go through that data again, and you might have to wait a few hours it's like to I get really the output put of it in customization. A, I right? really have to put it in a pie chart? or you know, Yeah, just, right? so what happens if you say to, to uh, you know, this, this, this capability, this is good, but hey, I, can you plot this in a bar graph for me? Well, that's the cool thing, is that it can take that kind of information, and two things are happening. Number one, recall. It remembers everything that it said to you, right? You asked this question, I produced this data, I got the data in this way, and I also collated it so that it had this formatting. Notice the prompt We didn't give it any more context. We just said, yeah, can you just give this to me in a bar graph? So imagine you're the CFO. You're like, this is good. Uh, Can can you put this in a bar graph for me? It's like, done. (laughs) Yeah, and it's like, no problem. Yeah. Here's your data, and here's here's the other important piece. Well, and then what what the the, the CFO is not saying, uh, they're they're saying, and can you do it like in the next few minutes? Don't go back to your desk or or, uh, uh, send it to me in a couple hours or... And I'm watching. 
Yeah. Can you do it right, <laughs> like right now? I mean, yeah. done, right? And what's cool is that, again, there are a lot of micro decisions that are being made about the formatting of this information, right? The x-axis in this case is taking every single one of those recurring transactions, itemizing them and grouping them by the largest ones, right? So that you can do an immediate analysis of like, oh, the ones on the, on the left are the, the main ones that I have opportunity in. And then check this out. It also is smart enough to group it by currency because it looked at the list and it said, oh, that's interesting. There is a, a, gr a natural grouping that is occurring here. So I'm going to make a different color choice for the Canadian dollar transactions <laughs> yeah. versus the USD <laughs> ones. And it did this on the fly, right? You didn't have to tell it anything. Right. The context was just put it into a bar graph. And th I think this is where the breakthrough is, right? Is there's this trustworthy counterparty, someone that you can just, it's like you can dance with this, mm -hmm. this partner, you know, like, and trust that if I give you this open-ended, almost nonsensical question, if I gave it to someone else, you can take everything else that I've ever said, know it, and be methodical with it, do something with it. This is why we're, we're I think, getting really excited about this. Yeah. It's, it's because at the end of the day, it's a completely different interaction pattern. And we have all kinds of interesting ones. So one is uh, a common use case is identifying anomalies, right? The previous uh, uh, example, we were looking for a, a, an easier exercise. One, it, it's, you know, what's the recurring transactions? And in machine learning, it's actually a complicated problem to do because it's what's considered uh, a recurring one. What is the, the, the calculation that you're using? Is it time? Is it recurrence of certain types of descriptions? Is it both? Is it a, a certain period that you should be looking at? 90 days versus 30 versus whatever it might be. So it's, it's taking care of all of those complexities. But the next step is, what about anomalies? What about things that are outside of the bound? Which of is all normal, the stuff that's, that right? scares the heck out of everybody, right? right? Exactly. Especially when you're dealing with lots of banks, lots of accounts, lots of data. Right. It's just impossible that your team is ever going to pick that up. And you know something's in there right. that you haven't found or you don't know about. And you're just, you're afraid when it gets unearthed because it's, it probably could be, uh, pointing to something that could be fraudulent dependently, yep. uh, you know, potentially, and you just don't know. So let's kind of reimagine our, our, our use case here. Maybe you're the CFO and this time you're driving and a thought pops into your mind of something about our balances is off. And I have this sneaking suspicion uh, that there is a transaction or a set of transactions that snuck through and we didn't catch it, right? So you pick up the phone and you call maybe your, your controller and you say, I'm going to need you to look into this, right? I want you to do a deep dive, go through our bank statement, find every single transaction that happened in an out-of-bounds way. Find them, give them to me because I need to review every single one. Mm -hmm. What a nightmare task. Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. have to then download every single bank statement. You have to format them, get them ready. And then you have to decide, well, what is considered an anomaly? And most, What's, I mean, just pause right there. Most companies don't even have their bank data catalog. Right. It's, uh, again, this is why the, the you know, work working with a little bit more mid-market, small enterprise companies, but in, in you know, you, you, you move up market, large companies, there, it, it takes, it's, if you're using these legacy treasury tools, it's taking, it can take years to connect all your accounts. So right. just getting your, all your data in a kind of normalized fashion so you could leverage it let alone even historical data, because even the legacy systems aren't great at, you know, even uh, having all that catalog to where you can utilize it on the fly in ways like this. It's no. just, there's no chance, right? I mean, right. That, and then most companies that just don't even have it, they've got to then start downloading historical CSV files from their, from their it's, online banking. It's just, that's no chance, right? This question is ultimately not a, hey, I'll, I'll get back to you in a few hours. It's, we might have to do a deep dive. We might have to take a few days to do this. And we're going to have to double check our work because at the end of the day, what are, what's the methodology that we're using to identify that anomaly? You know, it's not just as simple as, oh, this one was a standard deviation of one on the amount of every other transaction. There could be other things. What if it was an anomalous count? It happened more than five times over a period of time and it was unexpected, right? And this is kind of also speaks to the, why we're working closely with banks. So we have banks right. that are investing, uh, our investors in Travada, like 
J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Capital One. But it, you, you look at that, uh, if you think of, they're not tech companies, it's hard for them to kind of build something nimble off right. of the data that they have. They have the data. We're doing that because, you know, through the APIs of, of getting the data. Uh, of, but if you look at something like anomaly detection, th- that should be standard in every single bank right. portal. You should have something that, if there's something anomalous that stands out from the, from the masses of how you're, your bank transactions, the bank should have that just built in, right? just scanning and just provide and tee that up for you in the bank portal. So th- these are things where like e- the bank portals aren't really able or the banks aren't able to like keep up with just basic functionality. It's, it's like when you step into a brand new car, things that, that are just there now, like you're not, you know, doing this for the window. <laughs> right. You know? And all these basic things you take for granted, like sensors on somebody's next to you, Right up on the next line. Like, but this is why you have to have these modern things. Like everybody expects when you're backing out of your parking spot that you'll hear the beep, 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 beep. It's a sensor. I mean, that now is, it should be stock or standard in every single car. Everybody now takes it, takes for granted. Right. So I don't know if you've had, if you're driving in a newer car, you're so used to that and expecting it. If you drive like a, a friend's car or your parents or an older car and it's not there, like you could literally hit. You bump into a pole. You're, it, you're used. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But th- this is where all these things bringing, you know, they really should be standard. Everybody should have these tools and they don't, which is crazy. Right. And what, what happens here when you look at it is that once you get used to this kind of behavior, everything changes. Because in our example, let's say that you made that phone call. They did the research. Well, what's the, the next question you're going to ask is show me your homework. Right, you found one, and I'm scared now. Um, how did you f- How did you figure that out? Right, and we asked it a very simple question. It, it found uh, an example of a transaction. It's actually a pretty big one. So now we're scared, and we're asking why. Why was it anomalous? Show us, you know, what you did. And it replied with, you know, to de- to determine why a transaction is anomalous, we can compare it to the average transaction amount for the same account and description over the last 30 days. And here's the comparison. And it gives us that exact comparison. What was the average amount and what was the max amount? And that's why it identified and flagged this one. And it was for a Canadian dollar transaction. And, and that's amazing because at the end of the day, when, when uh, any finance person is putting together something, an analysis or a report, even something that ends up might being on a slide that gets presented by the CEO right. in a board meeting, um, at the end of the day, Everybody wants to know what's the lineage. What yeah. are the assumptions? How did you do your work? I just want to know a basis for what I'm looking at in that context because there could be a couple of pivots or things there. I mean, to be able to get almost like a log, here's, here's what I did, here's how I did it, and here's what you're seeing as that context because you could quickly read in there and like, oh, wait, no, I wanted 90 days. Which you could turn around and ask. And you could turn right? around and yeah. So this is, you know, obviously we could go all day. We could spend hours on a podcast to to show the different examples and why they're relevant. This won't be the first podcast. But <laughs> this for topic. sure. <laughs> and, you know, we, we're, we're choosing examples that are very contrived right now, obviously, because we, there are things that we're excited about and that we know they would be difficult to do if you just wanted to build it as a feature. And, you know, thinking of, of what we went through recently and other businesses went through recently when there was a scare with, with you know, SVB and everything that went on and thinking about cash flow. And understanding cash burn yeah. and going through that. And there are so many platforms that claim that they, they do cash burn analysis and how you might do that. And we actually do it as well. But one of the things that we were curious about was, could a tool like this help in a moment of fear like that? What's, what does my cash burn look like right now? And if it keeps going, what will happen? Right. You know, being able to ask those types of questions and getting immediate analytics, right? Trend, trends are, I mean, just the hallmark of right. always getting early indicators, just even basic things that even pop up in a, in a board meeting. And over the last few startups, there would be inevitably some, if you have a business that has inventory right. uh, or an inventory component, one of the signs in any inventory, uh, a business that needs inventory is inventory turns. Right. So that's always an indication. Every analyst looks at that because if, if the inventory turns um, starts to go down a little bit, you're not turning that over quick enough. It's starting to get a little stale. That means your sales are slowing down. Right. You know, so right. not maybe not necessarily there could be some of that, but 
all, these are all early signs you look at. What are your, you know, days of sales outstanding or DSO? These, these metrics are, you know, based on are your customers paying you? You're billing them. Are they actually paying you? Right. And if they're not paying you, maybe there's some economic headwinds because they're not paying you because they're managing their cash flow more tightly. They're stretching out their vendors a little bit. You're one of them. And that's going to show up in that metric. These are just early indicators. They're all based on trends. They all matter. And you can get stuff that's really recent. And all of a sudden you see a little change. It might just be a blip and nothing, but it also might be start of something. And, and, and that's why every single day, look in every single, uh, uh, for, for an analyst who's tracking stocks or, or if you're an investor, you're, you're tuned in to every one of those metrics. You're looking for the canary in the coal mine to try to be predictive. That's where our world is. It's all about, that's why the data, the speed of information is, it's, it's so key. And that's what gets missed because when you look at finance and even these, these treasury, these TMS solutions, they're all legacy. They can't do stuff on the fly. You can't really get into a lot of the, the predictive nature because the, the architecture or even the, the data that you have at your disposal is never going to allow you to play offense in that way. And if you can't play offense in today's day, day and age and you're caught flat-footed constantly, it's, it's not a fun place to be. No, not at all. I genuinely, you know, and it, it's really rare that I come across things that, you know, turn me into a kid in the <laughs> way that when you look at it and you think unlimited possibilities and this really is that, right? And I know it's probably hyperbole to say that this is the first of its kind in terms of generative uh, AI for, for finance, but it has to be one of the first because of the approach we've taken. And I, you know, to summarize it again, that importance of accuracy, the importance of context, the importance of privacy, those have to be bedrock in any approach that you're going to take with regards to finance, corporate finance especially, but you go up and down that gamut, small business, mid-market, large corporates, you know, mega corporates, they're all going to care about the same thing. They're not going to approach this technology if there's a fear of any kind of inaccuracy or of lack of privacy or whatever it might be. And I think that at the end of the day, because of how we we see this going, this is how you give generative AI legs, right? It's taking that hybrid approach of it is a genius, but it's a genius that is only made even better if it has the right tools. And playing in that way, I think, will change the game for, for finance. And it's just it's not just finance. I think that this is a repeatable kind of insight that could play out over many different industries. And well, you think even the term genius, like how, it also is a pejorative in our society too. How many times you like you say, "Oh, way to go, genius!" <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. it, it reminds me a little bit of yes, it's a genius, but it's also going to get a little bit of this way to go genius if it doesn't have right. If it's not married with the right kind of things. And exactly. If you also, I, I was hearing earlier uh, to um, another podcast on, on AI. So I was talking about just whoever has really these, the, the, the private databases that ChatGB doesn't ac have access to, whether it's, you know, Quora or Reddit or things right. like that, you know, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, it doesn't have access to those kind of things. And it's never really going to get access. We'll see how that plays out down the road, but those applications are probably going to release versions to, to leverage it for their community in a way that right. they can, they can do that. We just happen to have, we're sort of the, the, now the emerging leader in our field of, of really um, transforming uh, bank data, normalizing all that. And for, for in the, you know, corporate banking world or any business that's essentially larger than, you know, a few million in revenue and on up in terms of how we do that with the platform. We, all the things that we do is, is along the lines of, of automation. So when you look at that, that's all private. That's all for the benefit as we advocate and build these tools for our customers. Right. So exactly. it's when you basically take this, you know, on something like that we have that's private and protected, but also further can be, you know, weaponized in a way with something like this, it, it really is uh, uh, profound. This is, I mean, I, I think in general, this is why you're not seeing any announcements of saying any, you know, there's any breakthroughs on, on AI uh, along these lines because nobody has, they haven't curated, they haven't pulled together the right data set, the right tools, put all, put all these things together in a platform yet in, in this kind of way. 
And and this is why yeah. it's going to be really really fun as we move forward. And that's the thing. I think that the the thing to look out for when when announcements do start to happen are are any of those three principles violated, right? Because of course what we're showing here is production grade, right? It's something that is in the hands of customers and customers can trust it today, not next year, not this summer, it's now. And I think that that's going to be the important thing to look for. What sacrifices need to be made uh, by anyone else that kind of approaches this problem space? And are there reasons? Is it because they can't actually uh, provide the analytics capabilities? Is it because uh, they can't actually interface with ChatGPT in this way? Uh, All of that will be something worth kind of keeping an eye on because at the end of the day, what did OpenAI do, right? They opened the floodgates to everyone using it so that they could suck all of that context and data into their platform. It was not intended to be a private platform, right? It is using all of that data to further train and create GPT-4, GPT-5, like all of the next iterations of it. So it's really important then from an industrial use case, a corporate use case, to look out for privacy because at the end of the day, you can't really trust a large language model if you know that the very same finances that you're trying to calculate on may be from some other company or some other company over here. Will it hallucinate? Will it accidentally cross-pollinate? And those are the things that we want to make sure that could never happen, right, in our platform. And I think that it's an important part of our approach. And when I think the yeah. the it the long term approach that we've we've done is right, you know, because we focused on that that you know, big data layer, right. You know, at our core, we focused on security at our core. We just knew we had to do stuff that was, that, that stuff is table stakes. We couldn't get that wrong. We had to do, develop that early and we had to, you know, be able to breathe confidence. And that's why we have the customers that, that we have because they have been able to stress test it. And, you know, the, right. our SOC compliance, all those kind of things are, have been buttoned up for a long, long time. And I think being able to now start to build off of that, core framework is 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 getting a lot more fun absolutely so this was travada ai and this is gonna be fun saying that yeah this is not the first (laughs) time you're gonna hear about travada ai but um yeah this has been so exciting to work through this uh together with with francisco and others and just bring this to life and we're just so genuinely excited for this to be in the hands of customers and to get to interact with something that is so breakthrough, so novel in its approach. And I can't wait to see where this goes because it's kind of unpredictable. Just like when OpenAI released ChatGPT 3.5 and we just started to see unbelievable use cases. Imagine that, that in the hands of customers, they can ask it anything, right? And we're going to be yeah. able to see how does that develop over time how does the trust go up in terms of what you can ask it and all the different use cases? And we're going to be there, right? And yeah. and kind of keeping up with that pace and finding new ways to, to provide context and all of that. So I'm just so excited. I think this is an unbelievable development in our you know history yeah. as a company. And I can't wait to see what happens. Super exciting. I mean, now with almost 200 customers, you look at all the users now, two-thirds of our customers are treasury teams. The other third are finance teams, accounting teams. Right. We have some smaller companies. We have some really big companies. We've got this really great, you know, uh, 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 contrasting and context of just all the different use cases and, and users and right. segments. Um, it's it's going to be fun to just see the that collective thought and expertise to just iterate on, on uh, uh, what's being teed up on their own data in their own private environments. It's just, it's going to be just too cool. All right. Well, this has been Fintech Corner. Really excited about our announcement, and uh, we'll see you guys next time.